Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Welcome to the masterclass on Disaster Resilient Infrastructure Standards and Certification by CDRI, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. I'm Neha Bhatia, Senior Specialist Knowledge Management in the Research and Knowledge Management Wing at the CDRI Secretariat based in New Delhi, India. For those of you who do not know us, CDRI is a partnership of national governments, UN agencies and programs, multilateral development banks and financing mechanisms, the private sector and knowledge institutions. It aims to promote resilience of new and existing infrastructure systems to disaster and climate risks in support of sustainable development. This masterclass aims to provide an interactive platform for participants to learn on critical aspects of policy making and systems of systems approach while understanding international standards and certifications for resilient infrastructure. It will provide a detailed insight on international standard ISO 14,090-2019 adaptation to climate change and the sustainable and resilient infrastructure standards, the SHORE standards. This masterclass is structured in three sessions, each every week followed by an assignment which will be circulated after the third session. To qualify, participants should have attended all the sessions and submit their assignments by the closing date. Qualifying participants will be provided with a certificate of attendance for the masterclass. Today's session on standards for disaster resilient infrastructure is presented by Professor John Dora, Director of Climate Sense. The session will explore the existing standards for embedding disaster and climate resilience in the existing and future infrastructure assets and systems. It will cover the value framework of using the ISO 14,090-2019. In case you have any questions during the sessions, please feel free to write them in the Q&A feature and not in the chat box, please. We'll try to address them as many as we can towards the end. Now, without taking any further time, I'll briefly introduce Professor John Dora. He is a recognized international expert on climate change adaptation, standards, and sustainable development, infrastructure asset management. He has 41 years of experience that includes flood risk management and asset management of railway structures. His career in infrastructure has covered research, construction, and maintenance activities. He's also an independent consultant and has been an advisor to a number of organizations, including the World Bank and the United Nations. John is also a visiting professor at the University of Surrey in the UK. John, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neha, and, and welcome to everybody. Uh, good day to everybody. I shall share my screen and go through a set of slides. Now, I'm just hoping that everybody can see this cover slide. Yes, we and can. I, I Good. I shall proceed. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really privileged to be here uh, to, to talk about disaster resilience and standards in this masterclass. I do thank CDRI for, for requesting me to, to, to um, present and pass on some information and knowledge that um, I've been working on for some years now. What we intend to do uh, in this short session, this, the, this explores international standards that enhance resilience infrastructure systems to extreme weather events, geophysical hazards, and climate change. It's intended to aid discussions at this masterclass at the International Conference in May in identifying the needs and opportunities to establish and enhance best practice in resilient infrastructure using standards. The coverage includes ISO, International Standards Organization standards, it includes US, Japanese, Chinese, and Australian standards, and those managed by the European Committees for Standardization, that's CEN and CENLEC. And the CEN standards comprise standards such as the structural Euro codes, which are widely used outside Europe. For example, in, in the World Bank, Park Finance, Eastern Dedicated Freight Corridor in India, and Singapore's new Thomson East Coast Metro Line. Now, while scoped to cover standards, this looks further and across the spectrum of adaptation to climate change, as well as disaster resilience activities. And it, the, the whole sort of topic of um, adaptation resilience, I take a systemic approach to these. And in this presentation, this masterclass, we can include considerations of planning and development, 
disaster risk reduction and longer term climate adaptation themes. While not standards in themselves, the latter topics lend themselves very much to standardized approaches. Now the content is going to cover standards generally, how standards can make a difference, types of standards, entry points in terms of using standards in infrastructure projects. And we're also going to cover resilient standards, challenges, opportunities, initiatives. There are some case studies here as well, some considerations for ruling out the use of standards and some recommendations at the very end. And then we have some short time for discussion. So I'll just pause there and just replenish uh, some liquid. Now on standards generally, but making a difference, standards cover a wide range of subjects, a wide range of subjects from construction to nanotechnology from energy management to health and safety. They can be very specific, such as to a particular type of product or general, such as management practices. In building resilience, standards feature in technical specifications, in construction and in transport operations. Across management processes from energy management to health and safety, and in specific areas, such as disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. Standards help to enhance the resilience of infrastructure systems to extreme weather events, geophysical hazards and climate change adaptation. In many cases, as with the Chinese GB50011 code, for seismic design of buildings and the UNISDR's checklists, standards recognize there are no single actions by which infrastructure will become instantly resilient, even if all the information is necess necessary is available. Some standards recognize that organizations begin with very different capabilities to act in a resilient way. Standards can be mandated by a funding body or by a government, or they can be voluntary, they can be adopted by an organization who think this standard is a good thing to have. Different types of standards include guidelines, which are fairly soft. They, they advise on how to um, become compliant with the standard, but they're not mandatory. Codes of practice are similar. Requirement standards use the word shall very often, which means you have to do something. Standards are recognized best practice and they tend to be politically neutral. Technical people use them because they're professionally obliged to follow best international resilience and risk reduction factors. This can help to avoid short term political inconvenience. Standards are drafted by recognized experts so can be used to demonstrate best international resilience and risk reduction practice. The experts volunteer to take part in panels who draft the standards over a number of years. This results in an open and transparent and consensus based process. So everybody agrees that this is the best way of doing something. Standards provide opportunities for improved consistency, increased flexibility and decreased effort because they're sharing resilience and risk reduction experience. Other people might have thought of this problem. Other people have solved this problem. We draft the solution to a standard and spread that good knowledge. Standards are used by many organizations, including governments, regulators, and influential clients to learn and describe expected best practice. They provide a clear framework for service providers and manufacturers to demonstrate resilience to clients and customers. Standards can be a tool to support legislation, such as resilience and other topics like development planning. Standards form documents for common and repeated use to effective mainstreaming of resilience practice, and they can reflect market needs and opportunities for resilience as well. 
Standards can remove trade barriers and facilitate access to markets by assuring mutually acceptable levels of resilience across boundaries, so cross country, cross border, cross authority. And standards can be said to have teeth and influence on infrastructure, disaster resilience and climate resilience. Now, as climate change and disasters affect infrastructure systems and services, and I'm thinking of transport, energy, water, and information communications technology systems, it's useful to consider standards as tools for designers, builders, operators, and users to ensure the safe delivery and continued safe operation of infrastructure services. And I talk a bit in this presentation, in this masterclass about ISO 14,090, which is a new, a relatively new standard for adaptation to climate change. But many construction standards, the point I'm making bold here, many need modifying to cover the future, cover resilience in the future, because there are so many changes like climate change, demographic change, and population change. And there is work going on to change some of these for future climate. Entry points. Planning guidance has a significant influence on resilience, being part of an enabling framework that governs what development is permitted and where development is permitted. And some time ago, while I was reviewing different countries' resilience preparations for a piece of work for the Asian Development Bank and the UN Economic Commission for Asia Pacific, I realized that many countries tended to point towards national or regional planning guidance. A Chinese example being the standard for urban residential area planning and design. Such guides form useful pre-development and pre-construction aid memoirs that can bring about infrastructure resilience through simple things, and I say simple, through simple things like avoidance of exposure to hazards. For instance, do not build in flood prone or earthquake prone zones. They can help avoid disasters by reducing risks in exposed areas. If you are building in those flood prone or earthquake prone zones, build things with a resilient design process, resilient design built into the new work or retrofit resilience into existing works. And another way we can reduce risks is by installing and using flood, uh, flood forecasts or tsunami warning systems. We're mitigating exposure is challenging. We can't effectively mitigate the exposure of existing or new infrastructure, then build in some sort of prediction, cyclone predictions, tsunami warnings. Planning guidance can be very variable between territories in terms of the resilience offered, however. For organizations wishing to ensure resilience beyond the requirements of local planning, a benchmarking exercise can be useful between international standards and local standards to gauge which framework offers the greatest resilience. And standards can be used in the early stages of infrastructure design. By communicating to those involved in comparing the outline par parameters of an infrastructure project. So early thinking conceptual design is really quite important. Get the concept well thought out, then the infrastructure project can be built through lower costs and better have better serviceability throughout its life cycle. So considerations might include the service parameters. What are the required generating capacities at a hydropower plant? its reliability and normal service, and its resilience in extreme conditions, including things like thresholds of resilience and response actions that the local operators and managers would need to take. Its connections with transmission networks and how these are resilient as well are quite important. And we would expect these things to be built in to the normal operation of a, a hydropower plant. For water treatment plants, output specifications in litres per hour of metrics that can be used. For public transport systems, you might think about passenger throughput as a metric 
bandwidth uh, communication centers and server ins installations are the kinds of metrics that we can build into a design to think how are these metrics going to be affected when there is disruption, when there is extreme weather, when there is a storm. Thinking through the concept as well, quality parameters and architectural design are quite important. Surface finishes, coloring, structure and form, these can all affect the long-term durability of infrastructure. For instance, the ability of an infrastructure component like a bridge to shed water, so water doesn't sit in, in pools, which can cause corrosion. Uh, the ability to maintain structures, infrastructure easily, access routes into inspect and maintain and change components are really things you need to think about in conceptual design. And also the thresholds beyond which the design no longer offers safe resilience and thresholds beyond which additional measures, strengthening or, or new components are required. These are all themes that can be thought of for the conceptual design of infrastructure. Think about resilience to extreme weather. Think about resilience to long-term climate change and how to build in that resilience, how to build in redundancy for stresses expected in the future. Perhaps using design years, look ahead to a particular year and design the infrastructure for that year with a different climate and different loadings. By doing that, we can look at then at thresholds beyond which resilience is no longer delivered and plan for a future where we can build that resilience back into the infrastructure. Think also, I mean, very much these days we talk about net zero and, and, and carbon reduction. Think also about sustainability, contribution to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, whether to adopt a whole life or a life cycle costing approach, which can help to ensure the ease of operation and main, maintenance, and the ease of operation and maintenance for longevity of the infrastructure, not necessarily just for now, but for the long term future of that infrastructure. And a couple of points on the screen now, it's easier to change designs when they're on the drawing board than when construction is underway. When we think of whole life costing, we think it's better to do the changes on the drawing board so that we end up with a well thought out project. But it's even better to avoid exposure to hazards. So some entry points. Then we think again about resilient standards. Now here is a list. I'll just leave them up for a couple of seconds for you to have a quick look at. Now this is just a, a short list of a handful of international USA, Australian, European, Chinese and sets of specific standards that I put together a couple of years ago. So just an illustrative list. And you can see how planning features quite a lot in some of these. But also we look at sectors, like on the right here, we've got a railway uh, and navigation and waterway, ports and waterways sector, uh, climate resilience for water and wastewater and hydropower. So there, there are set to specific standards that organizations produce, but there are also national and regional and international standards that cover these topics. Some are very detailed, some are guidance, some are mandatory, some have lots of requirements in them. And I shall speak a bit about the ISO 14,090 standard, which is on the top left. ISO 14,090 was the first international standard on adaptation to climate change. And it's been drafted in such a way that it's quite relevant to disaster risk reduction as well as long-term adaptation to climate change. I was privileged to be the convener of the working group that drafted ISO 14,090, and we spent four years putting this document together 
which involved seven international meetings with an international working group. And each meeting was actually four days long, eight, four eight hour days long, with lots of correspondence in between. ISO 14,090 was published in 2019. And it's the first in a series of adaptation standards, which gives an overall high level framework. And I say here on the slide that questions are asked at the outset of the standards about topics that you might not think too relevant early on when thinking of disaster risk reduction or climate adaptation. We ask about, questions are asked about the ability of an organization to produce adaptation action. And that involves the governance and leadership and awareness of the leadership of the topic. We ask questions about the life cycle of products, activities, and services. And products, activities, and services is, is like a, a well-used phrase in, in international standards. And we look very much at the organization's decision points and how long a decision might impact the products, activities, or services of the organization. We look at the capability of the organization, its resources, its knowledge, current and required for producing adaptation activity. And there's some guidelines in the document about how to go about assessing these things. But very important, the ability to assess impacts, risks, vulnerabilities and thresholds is a fundamental part of this standard. And in the annex, there's an explanation of using a technique called systems thinking to look at cross-cutting of systemic matters in the annex. And we use that in the standard to try and work out what the scope, the coverage of risk reduction and adaptation planning would be uh, to bring in good concepts like thinking about external pressures on an organization or external linkages, which might be activities like a supply chain, a long supply chain. And I've mentioned at the bottom of this slide that there's a, a white paper on using this ISO 14090 to support ISO 14001, which is the Environmental Management Systems Standard. And I'm sure there'll be a copy of these slides made available to you, and there's a link there that can be clicked on to get hold of that white paper, because many of you will be using 14001. Now, one of the things I do make a point of when I talk about ISO 14090 is very much in my, my life as a consultant, I get organizations asking, can we carry out a climate risk assessment? And this standard makes people realize that it's great to carry out some form of impact risk assessment, but it's not just about assessing the climate risk or the disaster risk. This standard gives a framework to take that risk that impact assessment and turn out a plan to deal with those risks over time. Many times I've seen organizations see the risk assessment as a be all and end all of a climate or disaster risk reduction process, but that's just a snapshot. It might get a tick in some box that they've done a risk assessment, but this standard mentions how to act on the risk or the impacts and much more is required than just a risk assessment. And another question, um, this is full of questions for users of the standard, but one I will pose to, to, to the audience here, and I see there's quite a lot of people, over 100 people listening. How familiar are you with 14,001, which is environmental management systems? How familiar are you with 55,000, which is asset management? ISO 55,000, ISO 14,001, both of them can be supported by ISO 14,090. And that's why we have a link in there. So ISO 14,090 covers many different areas. Like I said earlier on, the way that we draft these standards is based upon consensus and experts with international outreach. And ISO 40,090 can be applied in any organization. It doesn't have a one size fits all 
process, ask questions and ask organizations to look at their own operations, their activities, their products or services, and produces steps where organizations can take a flexible approach and tailor an adaptation or resilience building plan to suit themselves. This flexible approach that we built into the standard means it can be used also at any stage of resilience building. So if you're already a local authority with lots of contingency plans for disaster risk management, we can look at that through the lens of the framework of ISO 14,090 to see that practically every aspect is covered because we think it covers all you might have thought about and more. It's an iterative standard. It's not linear. You don't start plan, do, check, act like we have in 14,001 and other management system standards. We can look at an activity in isolation and look across other parts of the standard to check that what is being achieved is being achieved in a best practice way. And some of the themes that we have in ISO 14,090 include embedding the resilience planning, the adaptation planning into the normal business as usual of an organization. Because without having this activity, this resilience building activity built into business as usual, it is difficult to make sure we have a long-term successful plan. And there are links into the Paris Agreement, the 2016 Paris Agreement, Article 7 on adaptation, of course, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I put in bold and in, in, in large type at the bottom, it helps to build capacity because one of the things I've seen and other experts have seen when looking at disaster resilience and climate adaptation is that many organizations start off with a, a low level of knowledge and need to build capacity to produce an effective plan that will stand the test of time. And some of the sort of guidance we give in the document talk about decision lifespans. You make a decision today to build some infrastructure. Now that might be a, a bridge on a transport corridor with a design life of 120 years, but it might still be, probably still will be there in 200, 300 years. So you think about what things we need to build into that design to make it adaptable for the long-term future. And that comes with understanding knowledge and capacity. And I mentioned how ISO 14,090 is the first of a number of standards. And there are already a couple of ISO standards 14,091, which gives detail on looking at climate risk. And British standards have just recently published BS 8631, which is about using the concept of adaptation pathways for decision making. And it's been titled Adaptation to Climate Change, which follows the same sort of um, theme that ISO 14,090 uses. And in time, this British standard will become uh, an international standard, another one of the ISO family. Now, BS 8631 talks about adaptation pathways, and it may be a, 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 an alien concept to many of you, but I've got a couple of examples coming that will help to understand, help you to understand 8631. Adaptation pathways look at long-term issues in terms of climate change and planning to deal with the uncertainty with some of the climate projections and uncertainties as to how infrastructure might behave, infrastructure might react to, to, to extreme weather events or climate events. So the guidance given in the Adaptation Pathway Standards cover the scope of the standard and the scope of the Adaptation Pathway exercise. It helps organizations to assess their own capacity to develop and implement Adaptation Pathway because an organization might need more knowledge, might need more um, 
resources to develop adaptation pathways as applied to an infrastructure project. It looks at how the organization can understand the uncertainties from current climate, as well as looking at future climate scenarios, including monitoring and evaluation of climate scenarios. And it looks at the different options for different levels of risks at different times in the future. And like I said, I've got a case study coming up to, to describe that. But very importantly, when I mentioned earlier this concept of systems thinking and Annex A in ISO 14,090, that encourages users of the standard to look at the whole system. And part of the whole system is thinking about interdependencies between different um, aspects of the infrastructure system. A transport system is there to move people and freight. And interdependencies in the transport system might include things like fuel depots and stabling depots for locomotives, for a, a railway system. It might include things like um, electricity supply and substations for overhead line current or, or, or third rail current for, for, for railways. And part of that system as well includes the people the controllers, the managers, the staff who actually work on the trains, the staff that work maintaining the railway, the track, the bridges, the stations, the signaling. So there's all these interdependencies, and they might even include supply chain and components, electronic components for signaling systems. So this standard, 8631, thinks about those interdependencies. ISO 14,090 encourages you to think about those as well. Then 8631 talks about assembling a range of different options on the adaptation pathway and working out, evaluating how suitable they are and which ones should be prioritized and then recommending preferred adaptation pathways. And then once these pathways are in place, and this all sounds very abstract, I know, but when it comes to the example, you'll see what this means. Once the adaptation pathways in place. It's about establishing the implementation for that pathway and monitoring the effectiveness of that pathway over the time and a learning framework so lessons can be learned and built back into the, the whole process. So the, the adaptation pathway process in the standard uses nine steps. And it's been used successfully on the Thames Estuary 2100 plan, which is the long-term plan that considers London, the capital city of the United Kingdom, London's tidal defences and the Thames barrier. The case study is based on, that's a picture of the barrier, the whole of London's tidal defences. And while clients can specify more realistic future climate design criteria, resilience measures and resilient frameworks for infrastructure, these will make use of plausible future scenarios, the best available climate projections, working with nature, strengthening operational maintenance teams and building infrastructure that can be adapted at a future date. Now this concept of adapting the infrastructure at a future date is a managed adaptive approach using these adaptation pathways. Now, the best example of, of, of the, the, um, the process is a TE2100 program, like I said, but it's also been used widely in places like the, the Mekong De Delta, the Irrawaddy and the Ganges, and the whole concept is enshrined in, in BS8631. I'm just checking one of my notes here. So the, the adaptive approach basically looks at what we have now, what the future is going to look like, maybe 50 or 100 years ahead, and working out what sort of, for this case study here, Thames Estuary 2100, working out what sort of future tidal defence system would be required for maybe one metre or two metres sea level rise. And the concept looks at what interventions are needed over the next 50 to 100 years to attain 
that new set of tile defences and what would you build when, bearing in mind the planning cycle, you might need 30 years planning to build something, 30 years of detailed planning to build something new. And factoring these into uh, an adaptation pathway that allows us to build something that replaces the Thames barrier that we see in the picture there, but not get in the way of the next intervention. So we don't have to tear something down and cause all sorts of upset. It provides for incremental or transformative adaptation over time. And because it's a long-term cycle, this concept of using adaptation pathways, we can review and link that into planning policy, standards and guidelines at appropriate stages throughout the life cycle of the infrastructure, which is very much more effective building this in very early stages, like I said earlier. And lenders who, who have considerable leverage when lending money can adopt a line of sight concept so that what is seen as necessary at the outset of a discussion about the project translates to fruition at all stages towards and after the delivery of a project. So we think long-term, we plan short-term to make sure we can build something that can be adapted over time. And we have a line of sight from now into the long-term future that gives an economic and technically sensible way of dealing with uncertainty over the long term. So the nine steps within the adaptation pathway, at the top we have defining the scope, aims and objectives. Then we have understanding the risks and opportunities from the current climate, understand number three, the risks and opportunities for a range of future climate scenarios, right through to the highest, most challenging scenarios. And we might iterate between those two stages. And then we consider options for different levels of risk and opportunities, and we might reassess. And all through these different stages, there's a possibility to reassess and iterate and form hone in on, on, on a well-developed solution. Stage five is to identify and evaluate the implications of the interdependencies, the system, of your own objectives and other activities. So the Thames estuary might impact on future development or transport corridors, so we need to think of these things. Then we assemble a route map of the adaptation pathways, which is a graphic to illustrate how this all works. We use that to prioritize the pathway options, we recommend the preferred pathways, and then we implement and monitor and learn. And at any stage, we can reassess, if we can go back further, but we have new learning that makes us change our thoughts as to how to implement the adaptation pathways. And later on, near the end of the presentation, I've got a, an illustration of a route map to give you an idea as to how that works in practice and how it's been used in practice. Some of the challenges of using standards, I'll go through some of these now, and then after that, I might um, ask if it's uh, all right to have a short break, a five minute break. But certainly on the challenges. Organizations tend to adopt or require adoption of standards if they know they have to or if they are expected to. In this case, the driver for using a standard is what some might call framework conditions. In other words, does the system expect you to or reward you for having the standard used? It largely depends on the decisions and requirements of framework organizations. In other words, those that set the options under which others in the system operate. Uh, and they're often government organizations. Any, any kind of government level part of organization that sets regulations can be one of these framework organizations or financing organization or large organizations with enough buying power to set the rules of trade or even their competitors. Some organizations will only do things if they have to, 
So that re requires a level of regulation of terms in a contract. In those cases, the quality of response depends at least in part on how those regulations or terms of trade are governed and set out. For example, if a tick box approach is allowed, that is all, all that is likely to be provided, then there'll be a tick in the box. It will be detailed, rigorous analysis. If more rigor is desired, then it would have to be delivered through some process, such as independent ins inspection or some sort of accreditation process, which this masterclass series will go and look at in more detail. An example here is that there have been very few sales of the ISO 14,090, so there are likely very few organizations yet adopting the standard. But if national bodies incorporate the standard as a regulation, and, and the country of France is suggesting they will, then there can be expected a significant uptake of its standard by the organizations affected. So if standards are enshrined in, in law, they can be well used. Coming on to design codes, most if not all structural and other design codes are based upon the past climate. Any standards based on climate conditions from more than 20 years ago are likely no longer fit for purpose. And sen Senlec, the European Standards Body, have been working to update infrastructure standards to reflect this situation, but it's only just beginning. Um, only since 2020, a move's been made to adjust the structural Euro codes for climate impacts in the areas of snow, wind, and thermal loadings. Now, this is understood to be a world leading initiative under the wide ranging N526 mandate from the European Commission, and that will have much impact. And I know these codes are being used across the globe. And reviews of the SNIP standards in East Asia when considering climate resilience found that some are likely to need revision to accommodate changing risk over time. Another challenge in using traditional infrastructure design codes is the concept of design life. Now, where, for instance, transport infrastructure, bridges and water infrastructure designs are produced that are required to remain functional for decades of service. And I know we design bridges to the structural Euro codes for 120 year design life. But uncertainty in climate and future weather patterns mean that to a certain extent, there's a reluctance to design for a wide range of future probable hazard events. So we design to current codes, we design with 120 year design life, but we're very reluctant to build in future uncertainty. And that's where standards like BS863 when using adaptation pathways can be used to inform the design of long life infrastructure in an adaptive way. So we can build something that can be altered in the future from time to time in a fairly easy, not, not really easy, but a fairly easy way compared with what we have just now in design codes. So I was going to ask Neha, is it um, possible to have maybe just a short five minute break? Sure, John. Is it possible to have a, a short break? Sure. Sure, okay. So can I, can I, can I suggest we reconvene at 20, at, uh, in India we tend to the hour, in, in Europe it'd be 20 past the hour. We can uh, convene in five minutes more. Five minutes, yeah. yeah. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. That was some of the challenges. I'd like to touch on some of the potential opportunities. And one of the themes you will see that keeps coming through this is the early stage thinking, linking planning policy, avoiding development in exposed areas, looking and reviewing at long-term infrastructure policies and strategies, using systems thinking to identify where things are interdependent and considering issues across all interdependencies, power supply, for instance, 
um, control systems, design, operation and maintenance, which might require uh, different infrastructure systems to rely on road transport or other transport systems, supply chains, governance. Uh, having a managed adaptive approach, the T2100 BS8631 example, building back better after destruction, future-proof the whole system. And one of the points I make here when using standards is that even though I, I highlighted earlier that construction standards might not be looking at future proofing infrastructure, we have an opportunity to specify more future proofing criteria. So climate design criteria, resilient measures, resilient frameworks for infrastructure, making use of plausible future scenarios, best available climate and extreme weather projections, working with nature, strengthening operational maintenance teams and building infrastructure that can be adapted at a future date. I'd like now to look at some of the initiatives that are current, that are quite useful pointers to what can be done. And these include, like I mentioned earlier, the Paris Agreement, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, the UN's work, the UN Commission for Trade and Development work with small island development developing states and some good reports there. And in, in many of these reports and the standards that I mentioned earlier, there are good references and, and good, good resources that can be fairly easily found using a search engine like Google on the internet. There's Europe's Pan Regional River Basin Management Administration, which loops across boundaries for large river basins. So it loops across borders there's Australia's ISCA sustainability rating system. There is the US Green Building Council guidelines for resilient design and construction. And all these documents can give good guidelines for things like building, using, and working with nature, with sustainability in mind, and so on and so forth. And of course, the UN ISDR's disaster resilience scorecards. And their associated documents. And there are many more available. Um, there are documents like the ISO Guide 84 for Standards Writers that helps to consider greenhouse gas reduction and climate resilience when drafting standards. There's a Sen Senelec Tailored Guidance for Standards Writers, which is similar to the ISO Guide 84, which has only just been published, um, but is relating to resilience in standards. And there are other schemes, and indeed schemes like CEQAL, the UK Sustainability Rating Scheme for Infrastructure Projects. So all these initiatives can really help bring together risk reduction, resilience and adaptation thinking. I'm running through now a few case studies in the use of the standard I was talking about 14,090. Uh, Transport Canada has been looking at climate resilience of the whole network in Canada and not just one mode, it looks across ports, marine, rail, road and air transport. Transport Canada is responsible for transportation policies and programs and they're using the framework in ISO 14,090 as part of a long-term ongoing set of adaptation activities. And key staff have been undertaking training in the use of this standard, looking at the whole framework to identify impacts and how over the long term Canada can deal with these impacts. The High Volume Transport Organization has applied some research recently to produce a policy guide for African and South Asian low income countries to re increase the resilience of land transport against future climate risks 
It's a joint production between IMC Worldwide, University of Birmingham, Transport Research Lab, and it's been funded by UKA, UKA rather. It uses the ISO 14090 framework as its core structure in analyzing the capability of existing policies. And it's been highly praised by the project advisory group who are involved in, in producing this. The, the framework, like I've mentioned a couple of times, covers things like governance and leadership and impact assessment. So the researchers at Birmingham University use the framework to rank existing transport policies in terms of risk reduction and resilience as part of the, the work to inform this new policy guidance. And I'm, I was trying yesterday to find a link to that. And, and when I get the link, I will make it available. Thinking also again of, of regulators using 14,090, the National Rail Infrastructure Regulator for the UK used the ISO 14,090 framework again to compare plans and strategies in the rail operator for the British Railway Network, Network Rail. Network Rail has got weather resilience and climate adaptation plans for each of its seven routes. And the ISO 14,090 framework was used to set up a scorecard to work out how well those plans delivered against international best practice. And that was a part of a, a set of analyses of the rail operators' plans that the regulator required. And lessons learned in that exercise include aligning the metrics used for resilience and, and weather resilience for the railway system to suit the system. Currently, the metrics measure the performance of trains against the timetable. But one of the findings was that metrics ought to be aligned to the movement of people and freight rather than trains against timetables. Important lesson that is about using metrics in, in the right way. National Trust is the largest landowner in the UK with many vulnerable assets across six different business areas, including stretches of coastline vulnerable to higher sea levels in the next century and, and, and beyond, to ancient historic sites like the, the White Horse in the picture at the bottom right there. That's a chalk, um, a carved into chalk on a hillside, not, not far from where I live, and it's, it's from the Iron Age. The National Trust saw value in using the framework of 1490 to align its climate decision-making processes with best practice. And the business units vary from um, looking after large estates of countryside to parkland, to coastline, like I said, to collections of old medieval paintings, oil paintings, and, 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 and stately homes. Very diverse. So ranking risk and priorities across these business units is a bit of a challenge, but National Trust was able to identify future needs, including simple things like awareness raising, increasing capacity, and changes in policy using the 14,090 framework. Going back to infrastructure, the UIC, the International Union of Railways, which is 200 members across 95 countries, published a Rail Adapt guideline in 2017 and made use of 14,090 as source material to set up a process whereby railway organisations can examine themselves to see how well suited they are to building resilience to future climate. And Rail Adapt, again, strong and adaptive capacity recommendations that the, the leadership, the governance of the organization has to have that sort of knowledge and capacity to be able to make the decisions that influence the longer term resilience of the whole railway network. And the guidance is, is freely available and can be found fairly easy with a Google search. Um, and uses, like I said, the ISO 14,090 framework alongside asset management activities to make sure that 
resilience risk reduction is built into business as usual. There are also training modules available. We have a set of training modules that, that my firm has developed, and we've had transport organizations, health organizations, fisheries, nuclear energy, environmental, academia, and human rights. I mentioned there's a human rights um, firm being involved in accessing this training. And there's a link here with a free module that can be viewed from your computer with some recordings as to pointers as to what need, needs to be done for climate change adaptation. And this course is, is building in popularity. And thinking back to the case study on the Thames Estuary, this diagram here, if I get a pointer, um, at the top here, we have maximum water level rise in the Thames Estuary, which is affecting London to about 12 million people in the, in, the, in the largest sort of London area that might not only be affected, but it's quite a, a large densely populated area. So zero, one meter, two meter, three meter, four meter sea level rise. Have, these rises have been considered using the adaptive pathways approach that BS8631 advises. And you notice there's no time scale against these. And H++ is, is a very high projection of sea level rise that was used at the time of producing this pathway approach, which as you can see is between two and three meters of sea level rise. The existing system was looked at and between one and two meters, there's a need to raise the fences. So the options looked at included flood storage, restoring interim defenses, a new barrier, a new barrier with raising defences and a new barrage further downstream of the existing barrier. And at each stage, these options that raising defences were considered and looked at the possible other options after that. And then flood storage was realised that if you build flood storage and restore what were called interim defences, that would only be effective up to about 1.4 meters. Something else might be needed, more flood storage and some modifications to the Thames barrier, which could be suited up to near two meters sea level rise. Then you'd have to do some raising of upstream, but more raising of upstream and downstream defenses, which brings you up to near the top of the H++ level. But another option might have been to raise defenses, over-rotate the barrier, and we still use interim defences similar to this one down here, which would give protection up to around about 1.2, 1.3 metres, and then you would improve the Thames barrier and raise the downstream defences, which could give you defence up to about 2.4 metres, I think. High level option one, high level option two, high level option three, high level option 3B, high level option four. So these are ideas as options. And you will see that when they've done this, they've drawn a pathway through existing system, raised defenses, flood storage, and restoring interim defenses, then continue with more storage, raising up stream and down stream the defense, just do that once, do that a second time. Then eventually we need a new barrage. But you only need that when your sea levels are coming near to the two, two point, yeah, this level here, the top of the high plus plus range, which is about 2.6 meters. So these options have been looked at and costed and benefits have been looked at as well. So a lot of analysis has gone behind this. So each of these options have been costed out and benefit cost calculations made. And the pathway that's been suggested here, as I said, is this one, which gives you a series of interventions over time, which are capable of being adopted as they understand more about where the sea levels are going. A good point I need to make here is that this pathway is lowest cost, highest benefit taking into account everything here. 
and it works well over time. There's incremental changes over time, which means the costs are spread out. To build a new barrage now, or, or fairly soon, after the defences have been raised, would be quite an expensive solution, which might not really be needed until the H++ range is reached. So all the existing system will become redundant. But by doing this part of the approach, we build this new barrage at the most optimum time, rather than building one now and not needing it for a long time. And these are described in BS8631 as well as, as ways as case studies to, to um, help people work how, out how, how to adopt such an approach for their own business. So that we have some case studies. And I've called this section of rollout considerations about mainstreaming natural hazard resilience, disaster resilience, and adaptation in infrastructure projects. I think that mainstreaming resilience in infrastructure requires a line of sight from what I call the heads of agreement to the delivery, the construction, operation and maintenance of the project. It's easy to agree at the early stage of project procurement that the project needs to be resilient to hazards. The reality is that impacts, vulnerability and risks are not and, and cannot be addressed using many current design codes and climate codes because they're generally being based upon the past climate. What is needed is some way some way that compels or otherwise persuades governments and borrowers and those involved in the procurement of infrastructure product, projects, thus design consultancies, construction companies, operators and maintainers and owners, with a range of considerations are relevant at all stages, from heads of agreement to the delivery of the project. International guidelines and standards point to high level frameworks that address key considerations, and like I was saying with 14,090, governance, leadership, organization, maturity and capability, impact assessments, adaptation, adaptation plans, resilience building plans, integration into existing policies, strategies and plans, making things business as usual, skills, resources, indicators, monitoring, evaluation, and learning feedback. I mentioned earlier as well, entry points, at each stage of a project carries considerable scope for reviewing things that lending work for reviewing workflows and linking standards and guidelines at appropriate stages, entry points throughout the process. Lenders have considerable leverage when offering funds that can push the line of sight concept so that what is seen as necessary at the outset of a discussion about a project is enshrined in all the documentation and translates to fruition during and after delivery of the project. And we could sort of discuss things like systems and criticality, like I see at the top here. Populations depend upon infrastructure systems that are interlinked. Energy, water supply, waste, transport, communications technology are all interdependent. Any sector system or assets that are in that sector can impact all society if they fail, but some are more critical than others. So, you know, if the power system fails, communication goes down, the transport system might not work. And because the transport system doesn't work, the people who would maintain the communication network might not be able to get to repair, get to a site to repair that network or the power system. So the cascading and interlinked issues. The ISO 14,090 standard recommends using systems thinking to scope out the coverage of the adaptation plan so that all these areas are addressed. Good practice in planning. Again, I've mentioned planning a few times. Evaluate planning laws and guidelines and modify them to reduce exposure to hazards, to disaster risk, for new construction 
and provide guidance and retrofitting and warning systems for existing infrastructure. The US and Australian guidelines can help here. Australia's toolkit helps local authorities navigate the complexity and uncertainty inherent in making decisions based on future climate and disaster risk. Capacity building. The Paris Agreement mentions adaptive capacity and ISO 14,090 makes organizational capability a fundamental part of adaptation and resilience building. Assessment of decision makers' capabilities and maturity could be useful. And there's a tool called CAD, which I mentioned here, capacity development and diagnosis, can help streamline that process. It uses nine different themes and seven different ratings in those themes around the governance of organizations to work out how well uh, an organization's capacity is for disaster risk and, and adaptation planning. Monitoring and evaluation and making the right changes throughout the whole project delivery process. Various standards show this sort of performance-based approach. ISO 14001, ISO 9001 on, on quality. These are best-selling standards on environmental management and quality management that use monitoring and evaluation techniques to improve and learn. And best use existing design codes, like I mentioned, existing standards are maybe not tend not to be future looking in terms of future risk future climate but organizations who have influence can ask can require the future climate to be assessed when designing new infrastructure so i've put together a number of recommendations here next steps for maintaining mainstreaming of the climate adaptation and natural hazard resilience including discussing how best to introduce these following topics and how do we bring these into uh, mainstream discussion mainstream activity a part of that is discussing these topics i should have said building infrastructure that can be adapted at future date this concept is the BS8631 using adaptive or adaptation pathways concept, which I've mentioned. Adopting a line of sight throughout workflows from heads of agreement to delivery of a project. International guidelines point to using high level frameworks, address considerations like leadership and governments, and these should be considered throughout all stages of a project. Thinking systems. Thinking criticality, using systems thinking to scope the coverage of a resilience plan so all relevant interdependent risks are addressed. And a simple one there that I keep mentioning um, in, in masterclasses, seminars, and teaching sessions is look at supply chain. How resilient is your supply chain? Can you review the contracts you have with external suppliers to make sure that? your own operation won't be compromised by say long supply chains or supply chains that are interrupted by extreme weather or disasters good practice and spatial planning i've come back to that quite a number of times avoid construction in areas exposed to hazards and if you have to build in those areas then modify and strengthen the infrastructure and provide warning systems. Capacity building, I've talked about that just now, about using tools like CAD to streamline the process of assessing organizational capability. Monitoring and evaluating, the approaches set out in 14,001 and 9,001, the ISO standards. These are tools to make sure that whatever you construct, you monitor and evaluate what is being constructed throughout its life cycle so as you can learn and build improvements back into the process to ensure that continued resilience is delivered. And lastly, on this list, lastly for this presentation, how to make the best of existing design codes. Now, like I said, structural Euro codes are used widely outside Europe. Structural Euro codes are national annexes for weather parameters. 
climate parameters, disaster parameters and risk. These national annexes offer opportunities to insert future parameters suited to the organization, suited to the country, suited to a region. So these are just some recommendations which you maybe have some, some time to discuss. And I think that's my last slide. So thank you very much for, for listening. Um, I shall pass back to Neha. Thank you, John, for such a comprehensive presentation. I'm sure all of us had a lot to take away, especially from the case studies of the use of ISO 14,090 and the BS uh, 8,631 across different sectors, applied by different stakeholders uh, in different geographic contexts. We have a couple of uh, questions in the Q&A box, and I'll just take the liberty to, you know, combine a few of them, which I feel they are interrelated. Mm -hmm. uh, there are questions on examples of standards that take care of green building codes along with these adaptation standards, as well as standards for construction of residential building in flood prone zones coinciding with earthquake hazard prone areas. Would you like to take them one by one or? Well, I, I think, think that the, the main, main thing is that um, there, there are standards and it's quite an exercise to dig and look for these standards. And I think that if, if I went back to, um, and, and I'm, I'm assuming they have, everybody will get a copy of these slides. Yes, they would. In, in some sort of PDF or something. It, yeah. One of my early slides showed a list of standards that are almost like signposts to, if I, if I go back a few slides, it might take too long. There's, there's, there's a list of standards that I compiled a couple of years ago, and, and it needs an exercise to go through those standards and find the references in them, because I don't actually carry them in the top of my head, I'm afraid. Um, but this, this list here. Now, this is just a selection that took quite some time to put together, but some, some of these give sort of ongoing references to other standards that may be useful in these areas. But certainly in my own experience is that the connecting up of resilience, disaster resilience, climate adaptation and design standards is not a mature activity yet. And one of the things I think that we can do in CDRI in time is to work to signpost which ones can be used in these detailed areas. And that's one of the things that we could possibly do um, in, in, in time, because very often the standards are just there without a guide as to how to use them all comprehensively and coherently. And that is an activity I think it needs doing. It's not a detailed answer, it's a fairly high level answer in the field. Thank you very much, John. There's another question on does ISO 14,090 considers the compounding and cascading hazard risks as climate change impacts exa exacerbate its impact due to this dynamics considered in the adaptation standard? And if yes, any illustration would be useful to understand. I'll just, is that in the, um, the chat, is it? Or the Q&A, is it? It's in the Q&A. Yeah, right. Um, Yeah, it, it, ISO 14,090 asks organizations to, to look at the risks involved. And it does pick up using the systems thinking process, uh, the concept of looking at cascading risks, but it's for the organization to understand. It doesn't say specifically, look at all your cascading risks, but it gives a framework where organizations can then think this could be a cascading risk. And we would need to, an organization would need to look at how these impacts affect themselves. Now, one of the areas that I've been working with infrastructure organizations is to look at, like I kind of mentioned earlier on, the impact of failures in the supply chain. And an example from about three or four years ago, looking at the now being constructed high-speed line in England, HS2. We looked at cascading risks from the wider supply chain on HS2's performance 
and we identified things like the electricity supply being key to the performance of the high-speed railway. And if the electricity supply failed, you would lose, likely to lose both signaling, signaling of, of the trains, which means you're not able to control the trains properly, and you're likely to lose the power, the energy to move the trains. So these two things were highlighted as being a, a systemic risk, which could be addressed by having the right well-written contracts for the supply chain that we're providing, we'll be providing the electricity supply. So that's the sort of thing I think of when I think of cascading risks. But the, the, the way that 1490 is set up is for the organization to think through its impacts and identify things like cascading risks through the systems thinking process, and then to address them with some sort of plan. I hope that helps. Very much, John. Thank you. Uh, there's another question on the work done so far in the Bangkok, Irrawaddy, and the Ganga rivers, rivers, and how much the work has been done on assessing and exploring adaptation and resilience pathways for 2050 and uh, 2100. And in continuation to that, is do uh, do suggest your preference for design life, and do advise on what standards we should use depending on our preferences. Um, also indicate the potential rise in costs. Yeah, I'll take the second part first. Um, my thoughts on design life. Um, I think design life is fine for where you have things like repetitive loads, or loads that you're certain of, like uh, traffic on, on a highway bridge or a railway bridge. In terms of climate and disaster risk, I, I don't think we ought to think of design life because there's so much uncertainty in the future. And I would, would advocate a process of, when we're looking at long life infrastructure that might be 100, 200, 500 year uh, design life, but we think of disaster risk and climate risk, I would much prefer, I would much sort of push the adaptation pathways concept like I described for the um, Thames Tidal Defences and maybe look ahead 30 years within a hundred years, within a hundred years sort of time frame. So if we look at hundred years ahead, if there are so many uncertainties in what the disaster risk or, or climate risk might be over a hundred years, 120 years, 200 years, then design for certainty what we might know over the next 30 to 50 years and make sure you design so that the construction could be adapted in maybe 30 to 50 years time. And that's something that, yeah, what standards should we use depending on our preferences? That's something that, that would make an organization think about its own attitude towards risk and its, its um, risk appetite. So my own view about what rises in costs is that we need to build in resilience when designing new infrastructure. But in terms of economics, it's much easier to, to change things incrementally over a few decades than to build something now that's strong considering all the uncertainties in maybe a hundred years time. So there's a, a talk there on economics that I won't go into now, but um, when we have fairly high discount rates, it makes it very difficult to justify spend, spending money now for long-term uncertain risks. So if we look at maybe 30 to 50 years and build for that, making sure we can then retrofit for the longer term, with knowing we'll have more certainty about the future climate in 20 to 50 years time, 30 to 50 years time, that's the way we can do that. So design life, I think, is not a concept that we ought to be using for climate weather type risks. On, on the Mekong and the other rivers, I haven't got any information to hand, but I can explore that may and come back with something on that. Um, this is just some advice that I picked up from one of my colleagues who's worked in these areas uh, recently. So if, if that's an approach that um, I can pick up and I'll, I'll make sure I make a record of that um, comment there. Yeah. Sure. 
Um, there was another one on the possible indicators for nature-based infrastructure for groundwater recharge and considering the rampant population growth, the over-exploitation of groundwater and climate change. And linked to it is, um, can we also use these standards for water security since disasters are often consequence of climate change which can impact water security, including the quality, access, and protection of water infrastructure. So these are the two interlinked questions. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's one about what are possible indicators. That, 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 that needs a bit of research, um, which isn't, it isn't my specific area of expertise, but I would advise people to look at indicators that look at the long-term trajectory and the indicators that can give you maybe one or two years where things are going over 20, 30, 50 years. Uh, yeah, rampant population over exploitation. That's um, a huge challenge. And the indicators need to be related to the actual groundwater recharge system, I think, as well. So, not being an expert in that area, I can't offer detailed advice on that. But we can use standards like this for, for water security because we need to look at the consequences and the impacts in the long term. And the way I would get really I would recommend would be some sort of workshop scenario looking at the long-term scenarios and maybe a an extreme scenario in terms of water security and working back from that to now to work out what stages what pathways could be introduced in some sort of pathway assessment to make sure water quality protection of water infrastructure and access to water catered for in, in these long-term uh, problems that we will be facing. But yes, we can use these standards for water security because it, it, it provides a general framework for looking at any kind of issue and water security with a workshop with experts on climate, on water quality, on water infrastructure. A multidisciplinary workshop is one of the ways to, to work out what the impacts might be in the long term facilitated maybe by, by somebody who's an expert on long-term um, climate scenarios. Right, thank you, John. Uh, there was a minor clarification by one of the participants on the issue of aligning metrics to suit systems. Which metrics were being referred to? Oh, yeah, beg your pardon, if I didn't clarify that. Um, when I talk about metrics and systems, um, having been introduced to this systems thinking concept some 10 or 12 years ago, uh, it was kind of made known to me that when you're operating a system, then the metrics for that system should be aligned to the purpose of the system. And the system that I was talking about earlier was a, a railway transport system. And a railway transport system is, is a system that is there to move people or freight. So the metrics need to be aligned to the movement of passengers and maybe the tonnage of freight. Whereas in, in actuality, most of the railway organizations in the world use metrics which are aligned to the movement of trains. And the point I'm making there is that if, if, the, if the system is for moving passengers and you're measuring the movement of trains against a timetable, if that train is empty, and the train is moving, then there's a tick in the box to say the train is performing well. But to my mind, if there's no passengers on that train, it's not doing its job. So the metric isn't picking up the movement of passengers. A good metric that's being used for passenger transport is being used in some metro organisations where they're able to count the passengers in and out of the network using the smart ticketing system, where people swipe cards when they move through barriers on the entrance to a station. So metro systems can or are using metrics that measure the performance of the system in moving passengers. So all I'm saying there is that we've got to be careful that metrics we use look at the purpose of the system because then there's this line of sight concept from the the, the higher level aims of the organization, which is moving people or freight, 
right down to the people doing work on the ground that are maintaining traps and cranes which allow the passengers and freight to move. That line of sight with the right metrics is the important point that I was trying to make. Thank you, John, for clarifying this. There was a minor query on uh, how CAD could help in developing capacity building. Yeah, CAD is um, a product that um, our, our company uses. And if you look at CAD.global, um, if you look at CAD.global on, on the internet, you'll find some information there. But basically, it looks at nine different factors in the governance of an organization including things like knowledge and aspiration in terms of adaptation and resilience building. And there are seven different ratings from being very innocent about the topic to being very mature. So there's a maturity index that can help to give a snapshot as to the ability, the capacity of an organization now and the measures, the plans that organization needs to put in place to become more mature in time. Right, thank you. Uh, there's a question on the ISO 14,000. Is ISO 14,090 applicable to organizations or to respective city governments? How different is the implementation of ISO 14,090 um, towards uh, the NDC plans, the UN SDG targets, and the UNF C's guidelines for adaptation strategies? That, that's a really great question. Um, if ISO 14,090 is applicable to any organization, um, a city government could use it to, to assess and, and produce its own adaptation plans across different departments. And one of the things that we were very keen to put into ISO 14,090 were a series of requirements on organisations to, to describe, it's kind of like a, a, a hook to, to some further work really, but describe how the organisation's adaptation plans support things like the Paris Agreement, which by implication are the NDCs, um, and also the UN SDG. So they're actually explicitly in there. You, you need to show how your adaptation activities support the Paris Agreement SDGs. And, and, and the, 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 the UNFCC guidelines, <coughs> excuse me, UNFCC guidelines for adaptation strategies would be part of that overall set that we don't specify, but it's one of those policy strategy areas that by asking organizations to say how their adaptation plans support their own policy strategies and plans and external policy strategies and plans, there are enough sort of what I would call hooks in there to allow a city government to pick up ISO 14,090 and look at its own country NDCs, UN SDGs, Paris Agreement requirements and reporting, UNFCCC guidelines, and work out how they can support these. Right, thank you. Uh, there are two related questions to the example of Thames Estuary. Uh, the first one is, is it possible to come up with an optimal point because rigid standards may lead to overspending, leading to a case where the infrastructure may lead to re reach redundancy due to age of technology and not due to functionality. This was the first part. The second part is with respect to this case study, uh, 2100, all, measure, all the measures are listed based on the level of protection, but how can we consider the timeline in the pathway of Excellent. Yeah, yeah on, on the first one, um, Rigid standards may lead to overspending. Uh, the, 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 the way to deal with the first question is um, that, that there's a lot of expertise in different disciplines that have been working on the Thames estuary strategy. And whereas you could still end up with overspending, because the infrastructure becomes redundant because of the age of technology. Um, that's something that would need to be considered on a case by case basis, in my view, knowing what we know now. Um, it may be the technology becomes redundant and we have to change things, but 
if we know that at the outset, I think it's it's probably quite possible we can design systems that I would call would be technology agnostic. So if the technology changes, we can still use the system. So there's one or two ways to deal with that. And looking at the measures listed on the level of protection, yeah, that's very true. We can consider the timeline, but the, the point with the um, TE2100 program was that with the climate projections that varied in, in, in knowledge and accuracy and uncertainty over time, the Thames Estuary program thought it better to look at the level of protection, the one metre, two metre, three metre sea level rise, to get the concept right. And as the science gets better in projecting the more accurate epochs or timelines as to when we reach one metre, two metres, three metre sea level rise, then we can introduce a timeline into the concept and say we need to do this by this sort of date. For example, when the H++ scenario came out, I think we were talking about 2.5 to 3 metre sea level rise, but actually we've revised that downwards. So that means the timeline changes. And it's one of these areas where through application of good monitoring and evaluation processes, we can work out what, we can work out a better, more accurate, timeline for when we need to act. So we set up with the concept, we thought one metre, two metre, three metre, H++, that's got a concept that seems valid. To introduce a timeline, we need to keep uh, reviewing the science and monitoring and evaluating the science and be able to introduce a timeline with the best knowledge we know now, maybe five years time, maybe 10 years time, because there are review points set in this overall process. I hope, hope that helps. Very much, John. Thank you. Uh, there was a query on Bilal following the 9001. Can we directly go to the ISO 14,090 for any kind of infrastructures if concerned? Yeah, yeah, you can. You can go straight into using 14,090 because the, the framework is, is not sort of um, what I say is it's not one size fits all. It asks questions of you and your own organization. And you might want to use 9001 for part of it, but that's a choice. 14,090 can be used right away uh, and, and can help achieve resilience and adaptation without having to refer to any other standards. You may want to use other standards. You may want to sort of factor in um, asset management, 55,000, because you use 55,000, but you don't have to. It's a choice thing, but you can go straight into 14,090. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts on how to implement the ISO standard in the transportation system, especially in a road network, which has impacted through compounded flood disasters? I think, I think that, that's a case of um, being clear as to what the impacts would be with compounded flood disasters. Then, then I'm thinking that... Um, we can use the impact assessment part of 14,090 to identify those impacts and then use the rest of the framework to work out how you can um, reduce risk over time. And some of that might require uh, capacity building, some of it might require lots of physical measures, and it would identify with the right degree of analysis uh, the sorts of um, short-term, medium-term, and long-term actions that might be needed. So, right. quite, 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 quite clearly, you can use fourteen thousand and ninety in 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 that sort of uh, set of dilemmas, looking at compound flooding in in a road network. Yes. Okay. Uh, there was this question in context of the developing countries where major issues lie on the quality of implementation. How do you think existing standards will be useful for developing countries? I think if, that, if that's about um, using existing construction standards, uh, I, I think they can be useful in terms of 
been used as a basis, but we need to have that sort of knowledge and capacity and drive to think about longer term issues, which are driven by the Paris Agreement and SDGs and, 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 and monitoring of the um, activities towards Article 7 of the Paris Agreement. And with that sort of frame of mind in place, then you can use existing standards, but adjust them to look at future disaster or climate issues. So the implementation is fit for the future. And the, I mean, some of the tips in there are thinking about implementation of infrastructure work. What sort of life are we looking at? Are we looking at 30 year life of infrastructure, 100 year life? We can use the 8631 adaptation pathways approach to help identify where we need to modify constructional standards to be within an overall ISO 14,090 compliant framework. Standards are applicable to both new and existing infrastructure. With disaster-induced shocks, as existing infrastructure is rather more vulnerable. Thus, ISO 14,090 focuses, focuses on retrofitting the existing infrastructure Mapping the health of existing infrastructure is another gigantic task. How do we overcome this challenging? And also really another related question is, are the standards different for rural and urban setups since the infrastructure systems are different? Well, with the first one, ISO 14,090 is flexible enough to allow us to assess existing infrastructure and the impacts on existing infrastructure. It, it doesn't just talk about it doesn't just sort of constrain you to looking at the future. You can use the framework to look at existing infrastructure. And ha having, having spent most of my career working on existing railway infrastructure and flood defence infrastructure, some of which is over 200 years old, um, the retrofitting of existing infrastructures is, is an area that I think many people haven't tackled yet, but I think is really important. And Yes, mapping the health state of the existing infrastructure is a gigantic challenge, but it, it's something that needs to be done in my view. Uh, managing infrastructure, in my experience, is it requires lots of data as to things like the condition of existing infrastructure, uh, how, how safe is that infrastructure, and what thresholds might impact upon that infrastructure if the temperature rises above a certain threshold or if there is a lot of flooding above a certain threshold. The technology is there. We need the decision makers, governments and, and, and policy makers to, to think about, to demand that we look at the health status of existing infrastructure. And I think that's the problem. It's a very big problem because very often Maintaining of infrastructure isn't thought about. We like building new infrastructure. But we need to bolster the and, and give the tools to the maintainers and operators of infrastructure so they can assess the health and understand that if these thresholds are reached, it's going to become unreliable or unsafe and use that to drive a program of retrofitting. On the other hand, um, one of the concepts that, that comes about in good asset management is that from time to time you need to renew existing infrastructure, not just small components, but major parts of it. And a good concept there is when we renew major parts of infrastructure, we renew that infrastructure with the future climate in mind. So it's to use tools like the adaptation pathways approach to identify the intervention points and then when we renew that infrastructure we we'll use design standards modified for the future climate to make it climate proof for the future and, and the great thing about renewing adapting infrastructure when it's renewed is it probably doesn't cost any more than adapting infrastructure using existing standards that aren't modified you're just putting more steel on more concrete or using different solutions native native based solutions it shouldn't cost you more than you, what you would have been, or much more than what you would have been doing anyway. As, as regards the infrastructure for urban and rural setups, um, are the standards different for them? I, I can't, can't really comment here because I know 
I know in some countries they use the same highway standards for urban and rural highways, but other countries, other administrations choose to use different standards. And, and the standards could be different because there are different levels of risk, different speeds for, for, for transport, um, different um, quality standards perhaps, and they, they, they just vary according to how local conditions might vary and politicians decide that this could be a different standard. Right, thank you, John. Um, the ISO 14090 is available at the ISO website. Please feel free to purchase it from there. Um, there's another question on the provisions for capacity building with respect to these standards, especially to workers such as masons, electric workers, who might not have access to formal education, especially in the context of developing countries. Um, if there are any provisions, then how do they access them? Uh, interesting question, actually, because um, if electrical workers and masons and, and others who are working in trades, they've learned something through some sort of tradesman process to, to, to be able to, to build things and, 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 and install things safely. So that, that maybe is a, a kind of education process and, and is, is understanding how that works in the context of disaster and climate resilience. But on the other hand, if masons and electrical workers are, are building things, then the people that design the things that they're building are the ones that probably need to have the capacity. You don't always need capacity throughout the whole of the construction network. People that make the decisions need to have the capacity and the knowledge to make the right decisions. And then the masons, electrical workers and others will do what they always do, but maybe in a slightly different way, which they learn through vocational training or, 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 or professional or um, on the job training, that sort of thing. That, that's just a view in an area that I don't know too much about, I must admit. Thank you, John. Um, there's another query on an insight of climate resilience standards applicable in green building sector. The last one is on the infrastructure and green hydrogen, the relationship between them and how, uh, how does investments go into it? So these are the last few questions. I'm struggling with the green hydrogen one because I, I'm, I'm not being involved in, in green hydrogen. Um, so I'm, I'm not really qualified to answer that one, I'm afraid. Um, but looking at climate resilience and, and, and green building, um, I do know in Europe there's been quite a bit of a work in scaling up from a project called Resin, uh, a European funded money to look at things like nature-based solutions and building them into buildings and infrastructure. And these are things that seem to be building up momentum just now. So climate resilience is something that sits by itself, but anybody looking at uh, building infrastructure or, or the built environment using uh, nature-based solutions and green solutions and, and, and blue solutions can look at climate resilient standards and overlay them on, on their own sort of building standards to see how they match. Right. Thank you, John, for patiently answering all these questions of the participants. I hope you all did receive your queries satisfactorily. Um, and thank you all for attending this session. Uh, you'll soon receive the details of the second session of this masterclass, which is scheduled on 27th April, Wednesday next week, um, at the same time. And the video link for today's session and the presentation would also be available on our website. Till then, goodbye, thank you, and have a fantastic weekend ahead. Thank you, John, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much indeed.